uh, uh, John uh, Cooper talked a little bit before about the difference or the lack of a difference between history and political science in Wilson's time. And I can tell you one of the differences between historians and political scientists now is that historians care about writing and they write well, unlike all the political, most of the political <laughs> science. I know Elvin accepted, um, but up today I have three of maybe the best historians in terms of writing that I know of and combine that with their dazzling intellects, just three of my very favorite historians. So you've got a real treat in store for you. We are gonna start with uh, Jeff Pasley at the far end. He's gonna talk to us about JFK's uh, profiles of courage. In his previous life, he uh, worked for the uh, New Republic and was a speech writer for Al Gore in 1988. Um, his book, uh, The Tyranny of Printers, Newspaper Politics in the Early Republic, is a great book. And, and the greatest tribute I can give to that book is that I ripped it off shamelessly in writing a chapter in my uh, Development of American Presidency book. Uh, I just found it an invaluable uh, book. And his most recent book, if you're interested, The First Presidential Contest, 1796 and the Founding of American Democracy, one of the great books in a great series that the University Press of Kansas does on American presidential elections, and I'd encourage you to look at that as well. I should also mention that Jeff is the professor of history and journalism at the University of Missouri and the associate director of the Kinder Institute constitutional democracy. Second up will be Rick Perlstein in the middle, uh, who will talk to us about um, Reagan. And uh, Rick has done what all academics uh, would like to do, which is make a living out of writing. <laughs> so I am jealous. Um, he is our really foremost historian, I think, of the conservative movement in the Republican Party in the 1960s and 1970s, and he has written three uh, great books. Uh, the first one called Before the Storm on uh, Barry Goldwater. Uh, the second one, uh, Nixon Land on Nixon. And the third, uh, The Invisible Bridge, which was published last year, or year before last. Uh, the Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan. And uh, I could list off all the, the New York Times bestsellers and prizes, but to me, the uh, sign of how successful he's been is that he recently got asked to throw out the first pitch <laughs> at a AAA baseball game. So now you're all jealous. That's right. What team? Yeah. The, uh, um, the uh, Davenport River Bandits. Uh, the River. Yeah. yeah, that's when you know you've made it. Uh, and last will be uh, Jim Kloppenberg, who is the uh, Charles Warren Professor of American History at Harvard. And I was uh, thinking about uh, Jim's new book last night when Trump uh, refused to uh, concede. Uh, and I thought if Trump read, I would suggest that Trump read Jim's newest book, uh, on toward democracy, the struggle, and should, uh, struggle should be in italics, uh, very much a kind of story of bloodshed and struggle. The struggle for self-rule in European and American thought. Uh, I uh, have that book on my shelf. I have to say it is 900 pages. I have not yet read it, but I plan to. I did notice that it was described as his magnum opus, which, I don't know if that means is that you're sort of done. <laughs> but I, I have to say that it's impressive because I already thought he had a magnum opus. For most people, it would be their magnum opus, which was a book he wrote when I was still in graduate school. I'm not trying to emphasize that I'm younger or anything, but uh, Uncertain Victory, Social Democracy, and Progressivism in European and American Thought, 1870 to 1920, which won the Merle Curdy Award in Intellectual History. And of course, he's also known for his book on 
reading Obama, Dreams, Hope, and the American political tradition, and he'll talk to us about Obama. So, Jeff, you get to go first. I have a lot of machinery here, so I don't get too, uh, too tied up in it. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to give you... Okay, it's doing something strange there, but anyway. Uh, first, I wanted to... Uh, Give the title. They didn't put the titles in, and I was very. Uh, I'm always very. I'm always uh, insist that my students they give everything titles. And a lot of things I've written, I'd start out with nothing but the title, and, and just go from go from there. So the title of this is uh, Pro "Profiles in Triangulation: uh, John F. Kennedy's Neoliberal History of American Politics." Uh, I'd like to thank also Seth Kotler and Richard Ellis and the SMU Center for Presidential History uh, for giving me this chance to poach on the 20th century. Uh, because as you may have noticed from the introduction that uh, this is not, not usually don't usually deal uh, with very recent history except uh, to living through recent history uh, though I'll get to there's some personal connections to, to this topic uh, that I'll mention in a minute but it's not only letting me uh, try out a hobby here but also to do it in such distinguished company is really an honor and really uh, uh, nervous making as well because I'm going to operate on a much lower plane, probably, than a lot of my colleagues, uh, and show how presidential have presidents used, a president used history, and presidential candidate used history very practically. John F. Kennedy's Pulitzer Prize winning history book, uh, Profiles and Courage, is probably best known these days for the controversy over its authorship, that is to say, uh, the, 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 the charge uh, that John F. Kennedy didn't, didn't write it. Uh, or as a baby boomer childhood curio. Uh, how many people ever owned Profiles in Courage? Yes, it, this, there's a, I didn't really get to use it in any of this paper, but there's this amazing uh, f files and files of fan mail for it at the JFK Library, uh, people writing in its, uh, the, the intensity with pe people love that book is really quite impressive. Uh, but it's actually a high, but my, what I'm gonna try to argue today is actually a highly significant text uh, that you look back at it, it maps out the future development of American politics, essentially by reading Kennedy's own neoliberal, or to be a bit less tendentious about it, just centrist, nationalistic, individualistic political strategies into the past uh, to control the future, as the uh, ad for this conference said. Uh, President Kennedy's success as a politician and pop culture icon established the validity, the viability of uh, can candidate-centered campaigning as the norm in American presidential politics, sapping significant prestige and influence from the national party organizations even before the post-1968 reforms damning the damaged them institutionally. And he had already laid, uh, laid significant ideological groundwork for this accomplishment, uh, if that's what it was, even before his presidency as a popular historian and, and commentator. The Profiles in Courage franchise, for so it was, as we'll see, not just uh, the one book, but a whole series of books and other uh, ancillary products, ennobled this, a candidate-centered, triangulating approach to politics that made a practice of strategically criticizing or opposing your own supporters and allies uh, and reading that as, quote, courage. In doing so, Kennedy fashioned a history of American national politics that almost completely omitted the New Deal and Fair Deal liberals that he happened to be competing with for supremacy in the Democratic Party, and that in the, the Democratic presidents after him uh, would uh, take even further. Though, since, though perfectly sincere, and I don't mean, I mean it's strategic, but also seems to be perfectly sincere, and, and it's actually, in some ways, kind of charmingly modest book uh, compared to, compared to the, so some of the, the, the some of the untold stories that we see in popular history today. Uh, Profiles and Courage was indeed part of a long Kennedy family campaign to burnish Jack's reputation and put him in the position to run for the presidency. One challenge they had was to counter the candidate's youthful playboy image and relative lack of political achievement with evidence of his seriousness. 
uh, the theme of courage called subtly back to the lovingly fostered story, the stories they had lovingly fostered about Kennedy's wartime heroism, while silently ignoring a pre-presidential political career that was really more ambitious than, he, than heroic. And of course, that's, this is something that was very much was said in, in public against Kennedy at, at the time. Uh, the, connections, the connections of courage to the, to, uh, the standard themes of Hemingway-style 1950s manhood practically write themselves. Uh, forming in the book forms an important, though not at all sexy, preface to the sexy psychodrama of Kennedy's presidency and its long cultural aftermath. But that's only one way of looking at profiles. More important to me is the political and ideological project that it represents. Uh, the courage that Kennedy, and just to be real, his aide and Amanusis uh, Ted Sorensen celebrated in the book was specifically political courage, not just Hemingway's grace under pressure, though that does appear on the, fir uh, does appear on the first page. The real author, by the way, and I'm not really bothered by the authorship thing, I mean, having been a speechwriter for a little while, I mean, ghostwriting, you know, ghostwriting varied to varying degrees, and. Uh, writing a draft of something that somebody else gives and put their name on it. That's not really that, it's, it's something that happens in all kinds of fields all the time. Uh, there's certainly enough in Kennedy's correspondence to show that he really did spend a lot of time on the book. Uh, and it wasn't actually just as you know, pop, the popular reputation is that Ted Sorensen did it for him. In fact, there's another real author, a uh, Georgetown history professor named Jules David, who actually wrote uh, some of the original memos and did some of the research that it was based on. Jackie had taken his, Jacqueline Kennedy had taken his class at Georgetown and recommended Jules David, and I think he got some, you know, a few hundred dollars for this book that made that made that uh, became world famous and 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 made made millions. Uh, all of the examples in the book, Profiles in Courage, were senators, quote, whose, whose abiding loyalty to their nation triumphed over all personal and political consideration, considerations. The Kennedy ideal of courage valorized leaders who flouted democratic pressures from their own party or, constituent, or their constituents in the name of some more, of more responsible measures or more national measures, especially of the type uh, that would be favored by uh, national elites in Washington, in Washington, or else the quirks of their own whims and conscious, conscious, consciences. When a Ken, one of Kennedy's modern day favorites, Nebraska Senator George Norris, was, quoting, approved, was quoted approvingly, I would like to abolish party responsibility and instead establish personal responsibility. As an early American by trade, and since it's been mentioned so much here today, it's hard for me not to notice the way this echoes the Republican virtue uh, and ideal of patriotic leadership espoused on at least some occasions by the founding elite of the United States, better known to most Americans as the founding fathers. The problem with the founders, in JF with the founders and JFK was that this ideal could be self-serving as well as noble. It was highly suitable for elevating the man above the people, and the, the, and the man not only above the people in general, but uh, the, lead, the, the man above the leader among the people and the groups who elected him, and the executive authority that he commanded over other parts of the government and the political process. Uh, this, uh, this dynamic of the president showing courage uh, in that sense can be good or bad, but candidate-centered politics is generally only pushed in that one direction of expanding the presidency, of elevating the presidency above everything else. And Kennedy obviously plays a huge part in this. Most of Kennedy's senatorial vignettes revolve around the political sacrifice made, usually by crossing party and regional lines in some way, in the name of maintaining the power and stability, usually in the name of maintaining the power and stability of US institutions. And there's a particular theme of saving the presidency in various ways. Usually, but not always, the less courageous choice uh, in Profiles and Courage was loyalty to party, home, or cause. And while the profiles included a number of pontificating moralists, making a strong stand on social and moral issues did not seem to count for a lot. The national convulsions over slavery and sexualism was a big part of the book, but Kennedy's anti-slavery heroes were Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri, to go, Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri and uh, Sam Houston of Texas. Their manly Southern indifference to the moral questions of slavery ever emphasized in favor of many melodramas about two lions in winter thrashing around at secessionist upstarts in their midst and, to, and with the main goal of defending the, territorial, the expanding territorial integrity of the United States. And I'm going to attempt now to have to play the clip that I made, uh, and I'll explain what the clip's from, but this is a, 
uh, Brian Keith of TV's Family Affair playing Thomas Hart Benton, and he's just gotten out of the bat. He spends the first five minutes of the episode uh, stripped to the waist, showing off his showing off his uh, show, showing off his muscles, uh, and then he goes into this little scene. Uh oh, do we have audio? Technology people. I knew it was going to be. Is there anybody up there? Is somebody, somebody, is somebody, uh, uh, I spent quite a long time getting these, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't just buy the Profiles and Courage TV show. Um, seriously, is there anybody, is Ryan checking? So is the audio on in the computer? It's it's on in the computer. Okay, let me try it again. Here we go. Let the the credit, credit let the credit sequence go for a second. In the interest of time, I'm going to. There we go. Another time, Sir Benton. All right, that's going to work now. Uh, of course, Benton's, Benton's, that's the Benton, uh, Benton uh, uh, standing up to the he's standing up to uh, taking a free soil position and running for re-election in Missouri and getting shot at. So it's a mini, it's a, he's, he's definitely uh, the good guy in that episode, but it's not, the, it's the slavery aspect is definitely not, not necessarily the center of it. Uh, it, this was the well-triangulated approach of a historian, this, this idea of courage. Uh, it was the well-triangulated approach of a historian politician, Kennedy that is, who in his political life rather quietly supported African-American civil rights, but still actively sought the support of Southern whites. And indeed, there's a lot in profile and courage uh, that has to do with uh, kind of trying to make a New Englander reaching out, showing he can sort of sympathize with the South or taking a national approach that includes the South. Uh, the Daniel Webster chapter of Profiles and Courage, uh, Webster's lauded for not following his conscience, supporting the Compromise of 1850 instead at the best behest of his old friend Henry Clay. In this, this clip, you, he's being haunted by thoughts of his great 7th of March speech he's about to give, and you'll see then, uh, even though he's directly confronted with the horrors of slavery, it's like that, that's, uh, he manages to make the courageous choice not to be motivated by that. I'm probably going to just go ahead and going to go ahead and, and go ahead and, and move past that because uh, because of, because of time. Uh, but what's happening in there there is he's going he's going to confronting 
uh, going to confront, the, he goes to visit a slave market uh, and is confronted by a slave trader. And while it's partly he's justifying the idea that he's the Compromise of 1850 uh, bans the slave trade in D.C., but it really comes off as more he's having to deny the dictates of his conscience. And just to make that clear, there's a scene later where Ralph Waldo Emerson and, and William Wood Garrison show up and try to pressure him, and he... He has to, he has to ride, courageously rise above uh, what the abolitionists uh, want. The most popular and paradigmatic of Kennedy's profiles, used in a separately published magazine article and adapted for, adapted for a television special even before the presidency, concerned Senator Edmund G. Ross, a Kansas Republican whose errant vote saved Andrew Johnson from, saved Andrew Johnson from impeachment. While Kennedy and Sorensen depicted this as a pure sacrifice for the good of the Republic, the real life Ross was a former Democrat who had been a fire, who, that while he had been a fiery free state editor and union officer, was like many former Democrats during Reconstruction in developing sudden qualms about radical Republicans' use of government uh, when they started using it to reshape Southern society and punish the ex-Confederates. In other words, uh, far from a profile in courage, what Ross was doing was he had, he had a lot in common, in common politically with Andrew Johnson. He was reverting back to being a pre-war Democrat, an act of ideology and courage, and he actually goes on to have a long career uh, as territorial governor of New Mexico, among uh, many other things. Uh, the other type of moral courage prized in the book was largely procedural, which is to say constitutional. At least in the world of profiles and courage, uh, JFK admired uh, quixotic stands against uh, constitutional, in in constitutional innovation and irresponsible government. Now conservatives would say uh, government overreach in a way that was actually quite typical of the old Jeffersonians of the pre-New Deal Democratic Party. So the one of the profiles that I'll mention is one that didn't get in the TV show. Uh, Lucius Q.C. Lamar of Mississippi, a, a, race, a pro slavery racialist college professor turned Confederate general who wins Kennedy's plaudits for agreeing to the deal that ends Reconstruction and, of course, pulls the troops out of the South, uh, giving a nice eulogy for abolitionist Charles Sumner without actually agreeing with him on anything. And then finally, a fiscally responsible vote against a free silver bill that was popular among his impoverished constituents. Lamar's sacrifices included never losing his place in Mississippi's white oligarchy and becoming the first Confederate on the Supreme Court. So uh, it's an interesting idea of courage that's being put forward uh, and sacrifice that's being put forward. The writing and, publishing, writing and publication of Profiles and Courage need to be seen in the direct context of the contest for the 1960 Democratic no nomination that was already going on when it was written and published. Despite Kennedy's roots in Boston Irish politics and uh, putative what we now would think of as a Harvard liberal pedigree, he, was a, he actually steered a course between them, offering himself as a new Democrat who could counter the, new, the modern republicanism of uh, Eisenhower and Nixon. The Republicans, uh, after 1956, the Republicans were said to be making dangerous inroads into Democratic constituencies, including the Sheen cities and the African American vote. Uh, contrary to Nixonian myths about him, Kennedy was not especially like, well liked by the party hierarchy or connected to its traditional machines. He was also a critic of the New Deal establishment liberals at the Americans for Democratic Action and similar, similar groups. Throughout the mid-1950s, Kennedy and Sorensen were producing, in addition to uh, profiles and its spin-offs, producing a steady stream of articles and columns for the popular press, national and local, that often previewed and re-echoed the themes of profiles, but also expanded and extended them. Particularly telling was a Life Magazine cover article on the future of the Democratic Party, which you see there. Uh, Life Magazine, I don't know how much the Kennedys paid Life Magazine, but uh, Life Magazine uh, there's a lot of Kennedy material in, in, in Life magazine, but, but this is actually not human interest stuff. It's actually about uh, his take on politics. Uh, it's about the future of the Democratic Party, uh, in, it's been published in early 1957, in the wake of Adlai Stevenson's defeat and Kennedy's failed attempt to join him on the ticket. Uh, Kennedy essentially, there's, I hope you can see that cartoon, I hope you can see up in the distance, you can see this, the cartoon that went across it. Uh, it's kind of a important thematically for the for, for the with his argument Kennedy essentially called for the gentrification and nationalization of the Democratic Party a de-emphasis on the grand alliance of workers and farmers uh, that you see marching across to Nick to, to marching across there if you look at the different figures in the car in the uh, car on the left that's headed over to Eisenhower and Nixon you get an idea of what he's talking about 
to de-emphasize that grand alliance of workers and farmers and reshape itself in ways that would appeal better to suburbanites and youth in the newly urbanized South. JFK's historical analysis in the article was that Democrats quote, needed to, quote, uh, retire the tired and tarnished holdovers from another era, or, he said, they would go the way of the Federalists and Whigs. Oh, wait a minute, it's not McCall's yet. Well, I'm gonna have to leave that, so I guess I don't, there's a, some pictures of Democrats and Whigs. Uh, in a move that, that presaged future historical interpretations from a very different angle, the two vanished parties were subtly cast in the role of supposedly, supposedly hollowed out New Dealers. The Federalists had rested on their accomplishments in government and refused to face the future, Kennedy argued, while the Whigs had flopped by, quote, going to the other extreme of, 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 to seek favor by appealing to the current demands of every group in the nation. According to Kennedy, the Democratic Party needed to avoid both radicalism, as it traditionally had, at least, you know, was it always had, uh, and a reliance on propitiating, in a, in a, in, uh, avoid, avoid relying on propitiating its parochial interest groups, as he put it, the farm vote, and this is him quoting him again, the farm vote, the Negro vote, the veterans vote, and all the rest. Interestingly, the Negro vote for the Democrats at that point was a new development. Uh, it wasn't like it was an age-old thing. They'd only been voting, blacks had only been voting Democratic for the past uh, 20 years before this. Uh, and only in the, pre the, the previous Democratic administration, Truman's had black problems gotten much serious attention. Yet already they were being triangulated against. Profiles and Courage was first published in 1956, receiving its Pulitzer in 1957, and as Jake's JFK's pre-campaign heated up, it was in the he was in the it was in the middle of a cycle of spin-offs that included the TV special about Edmund Ross, uh, which was expanded into a full-on Dunning School drama, including Birth of a Nation-like scenes about the horrors of Reconstruction in the South. Uh, this is before his presidency. A heavily publicized January, Jan, January 1958 article in the women's magazine McCall's uh, Three Women of Courage uh, did double duty by both ennobling, the, by diversifying the ennobling quality of courage and expanding it to women and including a remarkably tousled hair. Oh, he's been cut off. Sorry, Kennedy's, been, Kennedy's hair has been cut off by that picture, so never mind. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it was, it was quite a, uh, it went very well with the ads for Teen Idol Records uh, and pajama parties in the other pa in the other pa in the nearby pages uh, of McCall's. Uh, it also shared a page with a shared a page uh, shared a page with a little a featurette on how Burl, Burl Ives found his wife. So uh, in, a, in a screed against sex manuals. So it was kind of a, a high, highly mixed message. Even though. Three Women of Courage is actually quite an interesting article because it actually includes Prudence Crandall. It gets more serious in some ways by including uh, Anne Hutchison and goes beyond the, the book by not only by including women, by including a, a, some, you know, a more genuine moral opponent of slavery, Prudence Crandall. Um, the book's usable history works subtly but not particularly hard, on, but, but part, subtly but hard on particular Kennedy political problems, including normalizing his isolationist, somewhat McCarthy background and mainstreaming New England as the heart of the American national experience. This was a project that the Harvard historians of JFK's day were also deeply engaged in. In the, fir the first profile in the book is of John Quincy Adams, but not old man eloquent that we've heard about before, but the John Quincy Adams who uh, turned against the embargo and then joined the Jeffersonian Republicans in the name of westward expansion. In the 1960 campaign, Kennedy weaved the themes and rhetoric of profiles and courage in with others that are more familiar today. A generation of new leaders with better hair, poised to get the country moving again. Uh, he took the Democratic Party out from under the New Dealers and Liberals in what was in many respects the first example of a modern primary campaign. Then he took the country from Richard Nixon with, among other things, the, for the TV news controlled debates that had been inflicted on us again every election cycle since the Nixon era reforms of the party system. Uh, in other words, since the emergence of candidate centered politics, we've had to watch those, th those debates, though. Uh, last, last, la no, one last night uh, was, wasn't the worst one ever, but uh, whether those are, whether those are a, a positive democratic institution, I leave to the audience. Uh, Strikingly, Kennedy directly invoked and in some ways closed out his Profiles and Courage campaign just because before he took office in a speech to the Massachusetts General Court in January 1961. 
Here we find, find history virtually demanding a policy of triangulation against the mid-century Democratic Party. This, by the way, also seems to be the speech where the city on the hill metaphor was released into the wild of uh, presidential politics for Ronald Reagan to pick up later. Uh, this is quoting Kennedy now. For those to whom much is given, much is required. And when at some future date the high court of history sits in judgment on each one of us, uh, recording whether our, in our brief span of service we fulfilled our responsibilities to the state, our success or failure, in whatever office we may hold, will be measured by the answers to four questions. I'm just going to mention one. Were we truly mentioned men of courage, with the courage to stand up to one's enemies and the courage to stand up when necessary to one's associates, the courage to resist public pressure as well as private greed? Uh, just to close out, though. When Kennedy, while Kennedy was genuinely concerned with corruption and inequality, too, private greed was... A, Private. That's not a comment, Ed. Uh, uh, when private greed was a quality that was more easily denounced and guarded against when it was came to the demands of New Deal constituencies and government help, the older Kennedy brothers' new economics or departures from New Deal approaches to domestic policy have been more enough and noted in recent years than they used to be in response. But what happened is, in response to what seemed to them to be the economic doldrums, they became fascinated with the idea of cutting taxes, that cutting taxes would be the most effective and politically saleable way to stimulate the economy. Top tax rates would be lowered, ideally, but not necessarily as part of a package of reforms that would also close various business loopholes as a way to put more money back into the private economy. In fact, recently, there are certain conservative figures who've taken this saying that uh, Kennedy was the original Reagan. Uh, that's going too far, uh, but nevertheless, there's that, certainly that policy goes back to Kennedy. Uh, that's too strong, but Kennedy's version of history rather than Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s makes it clear that Roosevelt's style liberalism, style liberalism was, ne not really, was never his plan. Ted Sellerson celebrated Kennedy for, quote, blazing new trails and rejecting old dogma in economics, leaving familiar democratic remedies behind and taking pleasure in flouting his liberal Harvard economics professor, John Kenneth Galbraith, who'd been, of course, been sent to India. Uh, despite his alleged courage, JFK's relatively free market orientation actually puts him closer to the mainstream of Democratic Party history than FDR, at least in his version of it. Kennedy was quite literally the inspiration for the well-coiffed baby boomer neoliberal Democrats. I gotta get Prosper lives. There we go, Gary Hart. Uh, again, the hair cut off, though. That's, uh, who would, the, the well-coiffed baby boomer neoliberal Democrats who emerged in the late 1970s and 1980s, Gary Hart, Bill Clinton, Al Gore, and many of their Democratic Leadership Council associates. An even more dated term was Atari Democrats. Uh, they did not espouse Reagan's supply-side economics, but they loved JFK-style tax reform, favored investment-oriented economic policy, and market-based approaches to social problems. Uh, Obamacare and charter schools being two major examples. Uh, the neoliberals represented what then seemed to be a new departure in democratic politics, one that was much closer to corporate interests and less friendly to government programs in the interests of traditional democratic constituencies like the unions. Uh, cartoonist, Barb, B cartoonist Mark Allen Stamatis, Barb, Bob Forehead character, uh, modeled after JFK, actually captured a bit more than just the looks in some respects by making that figure, that, that look, the kind of central the the, uh, the 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 central legacy at that point of Kennedy of Kennedy's politics, uh, and ironically, it was Al Gore Al Gore Senior's father, who uh, Al Gore Senior's uh, Al Gore's father Al Gore Senior, who had actually uh, first confronted this as a member of the Senate Tax Tax Finance Committee, got given a ride on Air Force One at one point to try to lobby him for this, and and uh, was uh, stood up to the actually resisted the tax cut uh, in the Finance Committee. Uh, until, of course, Johnson came in and then rolled, and then rolled, it, rolled the whole policy over him. Um, so it's something that there's, a, there's these interesting crossing that goes on, I guess, between Gores and Kennedys, uh, the, in, in between that, the generations. All right, let me finish up by going back to uh, the 60s for a minute. And immediately, we've already seen, I've already, since I've already, show, I've already, I've already uh, showed you a couple clips from it, but I wanted to explain what this was. 
an immediately posthumous television adaptation extended and expanded Kennedy's vision with a more diverse roster of leaders, but made its individualistic free market approach to politics, government, and economics even more even starker than the book. Kennedy and Sar Sorensen approved all the additions, even though Kennedy was actually assassinated before it went on. Non-senators and non-whites, such as Frederick Douglass and Ann Hutchinson and Prudence Crandall, but the latter two from the Calls article get episodes, but Andrew Johnson gets an, gets an extra episode with uh, Walter Matthau and an Andrew Johnson wig, which I'm sorry I didn't have time to get a picture of Walter, John, of Walter Matthau and his Andrew Johnson wig, because it's pretty good. Uh, Grover Cleveland, played by the future Arthur Archie Bunker, got another whole episode for that I do have. Uh, uh, for courageously standing up to for courageously standing up to uh, veterans' pensions for war widows and orphans. Uh, no, wait a minute. I actually may not have that. <laughs> Looks like that's not there. Against them. Against them. <laughs> against them. It's against them. Sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I, I thought that was in the presentation, but uh, uh, after, after the end, I will I will end the conference by finding that and playing it. Uh, Grover Cleveland uh, stands up to veterans' pensions for war widows and orphans, and he and explains government lives by the people. Uh, he explains to the, the government lives by the people. Uh, Cleveland explains to the head of the Grand Army of the Republic, but pensions for dependents would mean people lived off the government, and that would be wrong. Uh, Archie Bunker, Cleveland says. Together, the various versions of Profiles and Courage gave a history of the Democratic Party in which New Deal liberalism played no role. Uh, setting a thoroughly consistent and, in Kennedy's terms, courageous course from the party of Thomas Hart Benton, Andrew Johnson, and Grover Cleveland through JFK to that of Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and I dare I say it, uh, Barack Obama uh, in different ways. But we'll, uh, there will probably be rebuttals to that later. Uh, I'm going to sit down now. Thank you. <laughs> So we're not going to learn what's wrong with sex manuals? What's that? No, we're not going to learn what's wrong with sex manuals? Uh, I, have, I do have that on my laptop. If you, if okay, in the Q&A. Okay, that's, cool, that's cool. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. The best demonstration about how Ronald Reagan used history is not precisely historical at all. In the spring of 1975, North Vietnamese forces evil, easily overran the South Vietnamese army conquering the nation America had spent billions of dollars and 58,000 lives defending. The Economist ran a cover story entitled The Fading of America. The New Yorker wrote, our noble commitments, our firm stands, our global responsibilities, how frequently in recent years have they served as a cover for self-interest and greed? The New Republic observed that it was the 200th anniversary of Lexington and Concord. If the bicentennial helps us focus on the contrast between our idealism and our crimes, so much the better. Vietnamese refugees were treated with shocking cruelty. A radio poll in a town by the name of Niceville in the Florida panhandle found 80% opposing their resettlement at nearby Elgin Air Force Base. The Associated Press reported, children in one school joked about shooting a few. In San Diego, a congressman told a reporter of his constituents, they think of the Vietnamese as nothing but diseased job seekers. In San Francisco, an army building providing shelter for war orphans had to be guarded around the clock for fear of vigilante attacks. But on one of the daily radio commentators, the former governor and future president delivered over hundreds of stations, Ronald Reagan told a different story. He recounted a letter he claimed to have seen to an unidentified publication from an unnamed American missionary. Quote, the Reverend described a 20-foot craft that drift, adrift in the Gulf of Thailand with no fuel, no, fu no food, no water, barely afloat, and sinking with its cargo of 82 refugees. Towering over it was the aircraft carrier, the USS Midway. The Reverend described the Midway as tired. It had already deposited some 2,000 refugees on other ships. Once aboard, they had one question. Would they be handed over to an unfriendly government, perhaps to be eventually murdered? The executive officer of the ship said, our job is to keep you as comfortable as possible, heal the sick, and feed you to your heart's content. That was the official policy of our nation, and therefore of the Midway. 
Reagan then described a miracle of the loaves and fishes straight out of the gospel according to Reader's Digest. Quote, a tiny baby with double ammonia was cured. People without clothes were given American clothing. Children were being given piggyback rides in the soldiers of American seamen. And Navy t-shirts bearing the midway decal began appearing on the little ones. Ads went into the ship's paper asking for toys. Charity begat more charity. He concluded, in the dark days right after World War II, when our industrial power were all, uh, and military power were all that stood between a war-ravaged world and a return to the dark ages, Pope Pius XII said, America has a genius for great and unselfish deeds. Into the hands of America, God has placed the destiny of an afflicted mankind. I think those young men on the Midway have reassured God that he hasn't given us more of an assignment than we can handle. Now, in its eight years in Southeast Asia, the USS Midway had actually operated as a death-dealing juggernaut. Listening to Ronald Reagan, however, you could imagine its only job had been rescuing widows and orphans. Others told you Vietnam was a crime, a waste. It took Ronald Reagan to explain how simple the whole thing was. Charity begetting more charity. To Ronald Reagan, the lessons of human experience were always and everywhere the same. America was God's chosen nation. Her people were, quote, the most generous people on earth. That's a phrase you find again and again in his speeches. For Reagan, Cleo was a god of allegory, not inquiry. Whether drawing upon events from the day before yesterday or back before the dawn of time, its two lessons were always and everywhere the same. The first is displayed in that example. As he put it in a 1952 commencement speech, I, in my own mind, have always thought of America as a place in the divine scheme of things that was set aside as a promised land. This is the shining city on the hill that he would return, re return to again and again, and that he first uttered in that dark year of 1975. Americans were also always loyal to one another. He liked to tell the story from 1853 of a Hungarian revolutionary, Martin Koshka, who had declared his intention on US soil to become an American citizen. He was later kidnapped by an Austrian warship in the Mediterranean. And here's Reagan in a 1975 broadcast. Quote, Koshka's manservant had been taught what our flag looked like. He saw an American flag. It flew from a tiny war sloop. The manservant went aboard and told his story to the commanding officer. The American ship's captain, whose name was uh, Daniel Duncan Nathaniel Ingram, boarded the Austrian ship and demanded to see the prisoner. He asked, do you seek the protection of the American flag? When Captain Ingram learned that Koska affirmed that he did, Ingram made ready to attack the Austrian vessel, which would have been, of course, an act of war against a country with whom the US was not hostile unless the aspiring American was released. President Reagan told the same story in a speech aboard the USS Constellation in 1981, when he dated it not to 1853, but to 1840. This time he added melodramatic dialogue and also added embellishing detail, like uh, that three more Austrian warships had sailed in to reinforce the force the first by the time Captain Ingram made his threat. Both times, the narrative as related was confusing and self-contradictory. Both times, he delivered the same soul-stirring conclusion. When Captain Ingram offered his resignation for embarrassing his country, the US Senate rejected it with a resolution that included the following words. This war that was never fought may turn out to be the most important battle in our nation's history. Now, of course, as historians in 2016, we have lots of tools. Uh, that let us check things that were not available to Reagan's contemporaries. And that phrase, in fact, uh, never appears in any congressional record, including the House and Senate joint resolution uh, in Captain Ingram's honor. Uh, Ingram never appears to have offered his resignation. And as Franklin Pierce explained in his uh, State of the Union address in 1853, and a version of the story that only glancingly resembles Reagan's tale of daring do on the high seas, uh, the captain was acting under the color of official U.S. policy. Ronald Reagan was famous, of course, for not getting facts right, uh, but the allegory was strikingly consistent. Americans never left Americans behind. Allegories serve a moral purpose. 
in this case, telling the story in the spring of 1975. And then in 1981, the purpose was decrying what he saw as the fact that Americans were leaving other Americans behind, for he believed in the conspiracy theory that Americans missing in action were still languishing in communist prison camps in Vietnam. Shortly before he retold the story on the USS Constellation, in fact, he told Clint Eastwood, who was sponsoring a mission led by retired Colonel Bo Gritz to raid one of these alleged camps, if you bring out one PO, US POW, I will start World War III to get the rest out. The same risk that Captain Ingram had taken. But that raises a paradox, right? Reagan told stories affirming America's inherent honor in precisely those moments he believed they were not behaving honorably. If Americans never left other Americans behind, even at risk of war, how to explain that Americans were leaving other Americans behind? Similarly, Americans inherently believed in the individual, were skeptical of centralized government, and yet Americans, alas, obviously did so often fall to the snares of liberalism and its close status cousin socialism. Fighting that, after all, was why Reagan pursued a political vocation in the first place. And this brings us to the second leg of Reagan's allegorical mission, to explain why Americans sometimes did not act like Americans. They did so, his stories served to explain, when they fell to nefarious influences foreign or alien to America. Ronald Reagan was a world historian too, and what the rest of the world's history served was as instructive contrast to the American way. As with so many historical allegories, ancient Rome was a touchstone. Uh, in, in 1978, he uh, lectured on a favorite book, libertarian journalist H.J. Haskell's 1939 The New Deal in Old Rome, How Government in the Ancient World Tried to Deal with Modern Problems. Quote, and this is also from the radio. Haskell wondered how a civilization that could build such wonders could simply disappear into the dustbin of history. The answer, quote, the growth of government intervention, extensive public works like our New Deal WPA, welfare system and food stamps, and he even cited a Roman cognate to the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, quote, which plowed under half the grapes to stop overproduction of wine. Like the U.S. Treasury printing money to pay debts, creating inflation, the Roman Treasury debased their currency by adding copper to silver coins. Reagan marveled they even tried wage and price controls with capital punishment for violations, but even then, they didn't work as they don't work now. By that time, government in Rome had brought commerce and industry to a halt with confiscatory taxation and a network of regulations. Silla. He found a similar lesson in England's poor laws. Drafting off a news report that one out of six people in San Francisco supposedly were receiving public assistance, he explained, we can look to history if we don't recognize what we are doing and where we are going. That welfare always hurts the people we are trying to help. I'll quote Reagan's account of the poor laws at length. England embarked in its first welfare program in 1547. By the end of the 17th century, nearly one-fifth of the English language nation was receiving aid at least part of the time. In England, the dole was often three times as much as the laborer could make for himself and his family. By the end of the 18th century, at a place called Spenumland, officials decided that wages below a certain level should be supplemented according to the price of bread and the number of children in the family. Sound familiar? In the next 20 years, the cost of the program doubled and redoubled until it was one-sixth of the total national expenditure, riots and fires swept the countryside. Continuing, in 1832, a royal commission was appointed to study the problem. At the end of two years, the commission reported, quote, the worker need not bestir himself to work. So they recommended that relief should not be made more attractive than the pay for the most menial jobs. They said, we do not believe that a country in which every man, whatever his conduct or character is ensured a comfortable living can retain its prosperity or even its civilization. In commenting on the social workers, they said their feelings are all on one side. Their pity for the pauper excludes any of the taxpayers. Reagan concluded, 
Some time back, a Rutgers University pres uh, professor discovered what the English Royal Commission learned 150 years ago. He said the billions of dollars that are being spent on the urban poor by all levels of government go mainly to support a growing uh, bureaucracy of teachers, aides, youth workers, clerks, supervisors, key punchers, and people's lawyers. The bureaucracy is sustained by the plight of the poor. When the old programs demonstrably fail, they are rebaptized and refunded. Now, when I first heard this broadcast, when I was uh, doing research on Reagan's uh, radio uh, uh, career at the Hoover Institution, I asked for an evaluation of it from two historical experts on the English poor laws. I, I kind of did a, uh, any jazz fans, a, um, a uh, downbeat blindfold test. I didn't identify the author. Uh, George Boyer of Cornell uh, said of the claim that the dole was three times higher than wage levels, I know of no evidence that this is the case. He said cases of welfare benefits being higher than wages would have been rare, and he noted the economic historian R.W.H. Tawney's conclusion that the 1832 Royal Commission's account of the poor laws was, quote, wildly ahistorical. Interestingly, that same phrase, wildly ahistorical, appeared in the response of the other historian I consulted who wrote a book called Respectability and the London Poor, 1780 to 1870. Uh, she called it a trite and mediocre effort by a banal and lazy thinker. Um, there was no dole, there were no social workers, and the poor law system was funded by a rate, not a tax. But the professor was not grading on an allegorical scale. It's not news that one shouldn't rely on Ronald Reagan for accurate accounts of history. In the most famous example, Reagan told the visiting Israeli premier in 1983 that he had witnessed the liberation of Nazi concentration camps, so he never left the country during World War II. In another, uh, President Reagan regaled a convention of, medical, medal of, medal of, uh, of Congressional Medal of Honor winners with the tale of a B-17 pilot who told a wounded tail gunner unable to bail out of their dying plane, never mind, son, we'll ride down together. Since Reagan claimed the pilot was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor, this one proved easy for journalist Lars Eric Nelson to check. There had been no such award. After he said so in his daily news column, a reader pointed out that the same story appeared in the 1944 film, A Wing and a Prayer. The telling of heroic tales was central to Reagan's rhetorical vocation. It is not incidental that both these inventions concern World War II, an event that naturally formed a touchstone of his historical imagination. As he put it in a 1983 address, during that time, my generation defeated totalitarianism. As a result, your world is poised for better tomorrows. Reagan was especially obsessed with this during the 1960s when his stand against student protesters was central to his rise to national political prominence. Frequently labeled a fascist for his crackdowns on protest, he used World War II to give as good as he got. That he himself had seen fashion, fascism, so he knew of what he spoke. He called his adversaries cowardly fascist little bands. The war also served as a rhetorical pushback against the hegemonic construction of the baby boom generation as uniquely moral which reached its apotheosis when Time, in the year he became governor, named Americans 25 and under uh, their man of the year. In such generational praise, Reagan saw a rebuke of his own. He would respond, as for our generation, I have no intention of apologizing. No people in all history paid a higher price for freedom, and no people have done so much to advance the dignity of man. For decades afterwards, he would relate a zinger he said he had delivered in response to a student leader who lectured him. Governor, you can't understand our generation. You didn't grow up in an age of instant electronics or jet travel or space travel or journeys to the moon. He gave his response, you're absolutely right. Our generation, we didn't have those things when we were your age. We invented them. Decades before Tom Brokaw thought to call it the greatest generation, Ronald Reagan got there first. Another frequent of his that we would now say violated Godwin's law, the first person to mention Nazi Germany loses. Uh, in an interview with Time in 1976, he was asked what would be the key policy if issues if he became the presidential nominee. He cited Jimmy Carter's approach to unemployment. He's for the Humphrey Hawkins bill. 
uh, the bill uh, mandated uh, federal jobs uh, uh, to be created unless the unemployment rate was below 3%. Reagan said, if, there, if ever there was a design for fascism, that's it. Fascism was really the basis for the New Deal. It was Mussolini's success in Italy with his government-directed economy that led the early New Dealers to say, but Mussolini keeps the trains running on time. The Humphrey Hawkins bill calls for the same kind of planned economy, and that would mark the end of the free marketplace in this country. Now, some of you may know that the arguments uh, uh, for the similarities between the early New Deal and fascism is not foreign to the serious historical literature. Uh, both shared a fondness for the economic arrangement known as corporatism, uh, which is not what we think of now, ruled by corporations, but a technical term that referred to sharing of economic decision-making by uh, cartels made up of uh, representatives of business, labor, and government. Alonzo Hanby, in his 2004 Comparative History for the Survival of Democracy, Franklin Roosevelt and the World Crisis of the 1930s, wrote, the Nazi recovery program organized the economy in ways that bore a clear surface resemblance to the early New Deal. The argument was pioneered by the distinguished Columbia University historian John A. Garrity and developed at book length by the German historian Wolfgang Schivelbusch. But these careful scholars would certainly not agree with Reagan when he said in a 1975 60 Minutes interview, you know, someone very profoundly once said many years ago that if fascism comes to the USA, it will come in the name of liberalism. Of course, the, the, the phrase uh, is generally uh, accredited to um, um, Upton Sinclair, and it's uh, come, come and wrapped in the, the cross and the flag. He continued, what is fascism? Fascism is private ownership, private enterprise, but total government control and regulation. Well, isn't this the liberal philosophy? Which to Reagan, as I observed above, could not but be an alien philosophy. And thus Dustin and that other repurposed phrase he used again and again for the dustbin of history. That was what history Proved. Now, to Reagan's acolytes, there was nothing to apologize for in Reagan's untruths because they were always in the service of a higher truth. Uh, in his influential 1990 hagiography, Ronald Reagan, How an Ordinary Man Became an Extraordinary Leader, Dinesh D'Souza cited a story from Jimmy Carter's memoir. Preparing to hand over the Oval Office to his successor, Carter felt it was important to brief him on some of the major issues that the new president would have to face. Reagan listened politely, but did not write anything down or ask any questions. The information was quite complex, Carter writes, and I did not see how he could possibly retain it all merely by listening. Yet when Carter asked him if he wanted to take notes, Reagan said no. Carter was understandably nervous about turning over presidential authority to a man like Reagan. Thus writes D'Souza who tells another story. At a meeting of big city mayors early in his term, Reagan didn't recognize his own Secretary of Housing and Urban Development and referred to him as Mr. Mayor. In these examples, D'Souza spies virtue. Like Lincoln, Reagan had an unerring capacity to separate things that mattered from things that were peripheral. He understood the importance of the big picture and would not be distracted by petty details. He was wrong not to recognize Sam Pierce, but the reason for his oversight was that he had no interest in the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which he saw, saw as a rat hole of public policy. He knew that if he went in, he might never come out. By and large, he was right. Concludes D'Souza, Reagan's greatness derives in large part from the fact that he was a visionary, a conceptualizer who was able to see the world as different from the way it was. He saw the world through the clear lens of right and wrong. This kind of knowledge came not from books, but from within himself. He understood the moral power of the American ideal and saw how it could be realized most effectively in his time. In my book, The Invisible Bridge, I call this Reagan's liturgy of absolution and frame it as central to his political appeal. It reached to an imagined past to tell an imagined future. But what kind of future did it tell? The lawyer and social critic Thomas Gagan points out that John Winthrop's actual 1630 City on a Hill Address, whose title was a model of Christian charity, was precisely not about America's superiority, but its precious vulnerability. Tom writes, the, speak, the speech makes clear that humility is our only hope. According to Winthrop, God put us up high, not to have the whole world bow down to us, but to give everyone a front row seat to view our example. 
Should we no longer be meek and humble, God would rain down fire on our heads before their upturned eyes. Now, of course, Reagan spoke of founding fathers like Winthrop in reverent terms. We've talked about the uh, a secular concept of um, history as contingent, and the other uh, alternative would be a sacred concept of time, in which time is you know uh, oceanic and eternal. And the founding fathers in uh, Reagan's uh, telling were uh, kind of bedrock of all that was beautiful, true, and good. But that's the irony in his, in his signature gesture to history, which invited us to a stern moral reckoning that was precisely what Reagan's injunction was intended to head off. Thank you. Well, thank Sorry about that. Thank you to everyone at SMU who put the conference together, and thanks to Seth and Richard for organizing it. You've listened through nine presentations by now, so I think I have to be brief. Uh, as Richard mentioned, I've written a, a book on Obama's books, and one of the central chapters of that is his use of American history. So if you find what I'm doing today too brief, you can take a look at the chapter in that book and you'll find much more mm. detail. The book is an intellectual biography that tries to explain how Barack Obama became the person who came to the White House aspiring to a kind of post-partisanship, aiming to end the struggles that had preceded his entry into the White House. Now, we all have different interpretations, I'm sure, of the reasons why he was unable to accomplish that goal, but I want to talk less today about his presidency and more about his ideas on the American past. I want to deal with a handful of different moments in American history that receive particular attention in Obama's book, The Audacity of Hope. Now, that's a book that pays a lot of attention to American history. It's a book that David Remnick, who has written the best biography of Obama, The Bridge, says Obama poured his soul into. And I think it's a book that deserves more attention than it has received. It's a very serious meditation on American history and the implications of American history for the American present. The first moment that I want to call your attention to is one that was just mentioned in Rick's presentation, and that's John Winthrop's uh, speech on the Arbella. Obama talks about the Puritan ideal of ordered liberty which emphasizes social responsibility as much as it emphasizes the freedom of the individual. Winthrop referred in that speech to the need we have to abridge ourselves of our superfluities, uh, which I think is the first critique of a consumer culture in American history. And it does seem to me as though the use Obama makes of that speech is about as different from the use Ronald Reagan made of it as it would be possible to imagine. He uses the same argument to talk about antebellum American culture and to invoke Tocqueville's assessment of the significance of the New England town for the rise of American democracy, just as townspeople in New England, in Tocqueville's rendering, saw that they were citizens by virtue of sharing in common projects from barn raisings to service on juries. And Obama argues that we need to rethink what we understand as freedom in terms of the role we play as citizens, we have to think of it in terms of our civic responsibility, not simply in our capacity to do whatever we feel like doing. The second moment I want to call your attention to is the Constitution. Now, Obama works as a constitutional law professor at the University of Chicago before he uh, goes into politics. And as a constitutional law professor, he has a fairly sophisticated understanding of the Constitution, but one that is quite distinct from the idea that there exists an original meaning of the Constitution. Instead, he adopts the argument that first sees the light of day in the law and economics, I'm sorry, in the legal realist moment of the uh, 1920s, and develops it in the way that some of his teachers at the Harvard Law School were developing it when he was a student. And that is to say that the Constitution is best understood as a conversation, to use Obama's phrase, as a nation arguing with its conscience. 
One of his professors at Harvard Lawrence Tribe later developed this notion of the Constitution as a conversation into a book, and he credits his former student, Barack Obama, with giving him that image of the Constitution as a conversation, as something that continues, as something that grows, as something that proceeds as history unfolds. So that conception of the Constitution and why it matters to us is about as distinct as, again, it is possible for it to be from what many conservatives think the Constitution is. The third moment is the moment of progressivism. We heard about both TR and Woodrow Wilson earlier today. What Barack Obama draws from the progressives in particular are two innovations that date from that period, roughly. The first is economic regulation, which he considers indispensable in a world of complex government state relations. And if he had realized that he was going to inherit the White House at a moment when the failure of deregulation would plunge the nation into the worst economic crisis it had experienced since the Depression, he might have put an even finer point on this issue. But he does emphasize how necessary economic regulation is in a complex economy in ways, again, that uh, distinguish him from many other people in the uh, political uh, scene today and that presage his bringing Elizabeth Warren to Washington to uh, try to put back in place kinds of economic regulation that he thinks the progressives saw more clearly than his contemporaries in the Democratic Party. The other dimension of the progressive era that he pays particular attention to is the innovation of the graduated income tax or the progressive income tax. And that enables him to launch into a stinging critique of the rising economic inequality in the United States, uh, which he sees as the most serious move away from the principles of the founding of the nation. He points out quite accurately that all of the founders believed that it was impossible to have a system of self-government unless people enjoyed rough economic equality. John Adams was particularly uh, vehement on that score. And the fact that ever since the late 1970s, we've seen the gap between the richest and the poorest Americans grow by leaps and bounds strikes Obama in the audacity of hope as a scandal. And he argues that that's the principal objective of all progressives in the early 21st century to address that problem. Uh, the Congress in the United States seems not to share that conviction. When Obama writes about the New Deal, he doesn't talk about the moments that David Zahat referred to in his presentation. He focuses instead, in particular, on FDR's 1944 State of the Union Address, in which he offers what he called his Second Bill of Rights. That Second Bill of Rights was a full-blown blueprint for a welfare state every bit as ambitious as anything that was put in place in Northern Europe after World War II. The problem, of course, was that in the United States, such a program would have run headlong into the commitments to white supremacy that dominated Southerners in the Congress. Um, the, the recent book by Ira Katz Nelson, uh, Fear Itself, is uh, the most thorough demonstration we have of just how successful those uh, concerted efforts to defang the New Deal were. But FDR nevertheless ran in 1944 for re-election on that platform. That was what he hoped would be the purpose of winning World War II, and it was what he hoped to make happen in his next term. Of course, he didn't live to see that happen, and it's not clear that he would have been able to bring the Southern-dominated Democratic Party along with him had he chosen to do that. But it's striking that that conception of the unfulfilled promise of the New Deal is the aspect of the New Deal to which Obama play, pays particular attention. Now, we're all aware of just how hard it is to pin down FDR and how many different FDRs there are. My argument is there would have been no reason for him to advance this program of the Second Bill of Rights except that he believed in it. He was going to win in a walk in 1944. He could have run on just about any program he wanted to. This was what he chose to argue. When the beverage plan was announced in Britain, Roosevelt quipped to Francis Perkins that it should have been called the Roosevelt Plan because his National Resources Planning Board had been working on a similar set of initiatives up to Pearl Harbor. 
that changes his focus, as he puts it, from Dr. New Deal to Dr. Win the War, but he never loses his commitment to the idea that bringing to fruition the programs that are sketched out in the early stages of the New Deal was his fundamental and lasting objective. Obama writes about the civil rights movement in a way that I find quite striking. He emphasizes the importance not only of militants, of black power, but also of the African American religious tradition, without which he argues it would have been impossible to mobilize support that was as broad and deep as was necessary to achieve whatever triumphs the civil rights movement did achieve. He has continued to uh, strike that chord. Any of you who heard his uh, address at Mother Emanuel in Charleston, his address on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, his address at Howard University this spring, all of them play exactly that same tune, that you can't understand how race relations change in the United States unless you keep in mind both the necessity to push hard and the necessity to keep in mind the sources of comedy, the sources of agreement, the sources of conciliation that are also deeply rooted in American history. All of his accounts of these moments in which he sees the ideals of liberty and equality being pushed forward in American history emphasize not what he calls courage, but in some ways something similar uh, to what we were just talking about, the willingness of, of individuals to find a way to make common cause with people with whom they disagreed. Now, that's never in the service of the kind of centrism or triangulation that one sees in JFK, but it is nevertheless something that usually comes through a kind of meliorism, through a kind of compromise. But Obama notes near the end of the book that there have been moments when compromise doesn't work, when conciliation does not work. And he credits people like the most radical of the abolitionists, the most immediate uh, of the abolitionists, the Garrisonians, uh, the Frederick Douglasses, who insisted that change happen now. And he says, when you look at the way this worked, he says, I'm, I'm left then with Lincoln, someone who was aware of the tragic costs of prosecuting the war, but who realized that slavery was the poison that had uh, wreaked more damage in American history than any other, and that this was the only way that it could be put to an end. So I want to stop with that. Uh, I want to leave us enough time to have a discussion. I haven't talked at all about Obama's foreign policy. I think there are historical roots to the Obama doctrine, which I'm sure all of you know, don't do stupid stuff. Uh, and I think that his understanding of the history of American foreign policy lies behind that somewhat chastened approach to what can be accomplished by American power. But rather than extending my remarks further into that domain, I think I would rather let us have a conversation for the next 20 minutes, so I will leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, so. Question over here. Hands are up. I'm going to take. Um, I'm going to take uh, Jim's last point about foreign policy and direct a question to Dr. Pasley, oh. um, because we really have ignored foreign policy a lot today. Yeah. I, I, it's kind of struck me. Um, and when you're talking about JFK and neoliberalism, I completely see uh, where you're going with that about that he's kind of undercutting some of the New Deal liberals. But JFK was also a gigantic Cold Warrior. Um, and I think that might have something to do with, with these links to the future as well. Um, when I saw the picture of, of young Senator Hart uh, on, on your PowerPoint, it struck me that, yeah, he was, you know, Mr. I ran the McGovern campaign and cool, long-haired guy, but he was also, he made himself into an expert on, on the Minuteman missile and on defense. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how that might work into your profiles and courage. Um, well, I guess I thought that you know, it's one of these historian things where I'd read what there was to read on her profiles and courage, and the Cold War thing is the thing that's talked about all the time. So I just kind of decided, I mean, it, that, yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, it's like, uh, 
it's courage. I mean, in fact, in fact, it, it's the it's you know it's clearly it, it feeds into the the missile gap and uh, and all the things he was trying to do to kind of kind of essentially slide in on Nixon's right. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I guess I'd read enough about Kennedy of uh, the stuff that like I, I'm actually not sure I, I I know I'm not sure I, I actually believe he's as much of a cold warrior as he sounds actually. But clearly, that's part of the image he was projecting. And, 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 and in fact, if you went through all 26 episodes of the TV show, or all, uh, you know, are, are, I'm so sure you're totally disappointed I didn't, I didn't uh, do, the, do the entire list, or, and all the people mentioned in the book, then obviously the Cold War, you know, standing up to enemies, uh, it, that's, uh, you know, standing up, this aggression will not stand. Uh, kind of uh, decisions are a lot of what's or 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 that kind of repeatedly comes back to that that you know even though even though there are people or nobody wants you to you have to do the right thing according to the, in a kind of in, in a sort of uh, the thing that the wise people the wise people would wish you to do uh, so I think you can, definitely can apply it to foreign policy. Yes, can I, can I just follow directly on to that question? Because it, it struck me, actually, on the foreign policy question, there's a number of different times that presidents, not just drawing on US history, but see it as a continuum with British history. And that, yes. I think that's the case with, with, say, someone like Theodore Roosevelt, who writes about Oliver Cromwell. It's the case with Woodrow Wilson with his studies of with the British constitutional system. And, and the question to you was actually in relation to, to Winston Churchill and, obviously, Kennedy's first book, is on why England slept, right. and I think, as in, in terms of a of a foreign figure who who plays such a powerful role now in the historical imagination in the U.S. and of presidents, the language of of appeasement, um, the 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 uh, the, the, um, the role of Churchill um, in you know in going against that is something which has which has sort of entered the historical imagination. I was wondering whether Kennedy at any point dabbled with putting a Churchillian figure into his profiles in courage, a non-American to, to be honest, it's almost more the opposite. He has a, a and there's a lot of things in there. I, I drop some things from the, on the fly from the, for the spoken presentation. There's a lot of times where he's specifically addressing Kennedy family issues, such as the fact that his dad was an isolationist and that he would, they were friendly with Joe McCarthy. Uh, so isolation is actually a surprising number of isolationists uh, in, in, in the book. Uh, he's actually kind of, uh, and, and even why England slept, which you know I haven't quite figured out whether I have whether it's incumbent upon me to include that in the written version of it. But it's actually you know it's why England slept, as in like it's kind of understandable that they slept, uh, like my fa like like my, like his like his father was. So it's not uh, it isn't the Reagan you know so it's. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, what, what's if if if. If he's lionizing isolationists, not lionizing, I, just well, you know, kind of a sympathizing. Slut, if he's you know. sympathizing with isolationists in the book, what is and, and the book seems so instrumental to you. What's what's his game? What's what's the upside of uh, triangulating against interventionists? Well, he likes to have it both ways, in the sense that 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 uh, it, you can be. Uh, you know, the main point is that you that you that you. Uh, you support our national institutions, right? That you are a, that you are a uh, uh, an American, not a Massachusetts man, or an isolationist, and that you can you can grow, and that's okay. Uh, and that and that the uh, the character that it showed to stand up for your isolationist principles or your or whatever, even even for your somewhat terrible principles or later exploded principles shows a character that that uh, you that, that's that it's kind of suggested that that will lead to. Uh, are right decisions and right actions, and, and inspire people, inspire young Americans correctly in the future. Um, thinking that most presidents and the ones that have been mentioned today, and, and we all do this to a certain extent, take the facts of history and skew them to the way we want to use them to uh, put forth whatever we're doing. Which of these presidents today, or any president really, and I address this to anyone, was really the best historian. I, I was very impressed to learn about uh, Abraham Lincoln in the basement, you know, looking up all the legal precedents and having footnotes in the Cooper Union address. I mean, footnotes. so he gets my vote. <laughs> that historians always vote for footnotes. 
I would argue one of the reasons that I got interested in writing the little book that I wrote on Obama was that when I read The Audacity of Hope, I thought to myself, this is exactly what I have been teaching about American history for the last 25 years. And this guy was paying attention. Uh, I think most of the people who occupy positions in American academic life, who teach American history in universities, would accept most of the arguments that he makes in The Audacity of Hope. And that's pretty remarkable. So I think part of what struck me about it was how willing he was both to present what was sort of the standard issue approach that we offer in our American history survey courses and to complicate it by raising questions that you would not expect somebody who was positioning himself sort of in the mainstream of the Democratic Party to take, sometimes further to the left, sometimes what considered, surprised me, more conservative. Now, part of the reason for that, I think, is that both when he's at the Harvard Law School and when he's teaching at the University of Chicago Law School, he's hanging out with a fairly wide range of people. And the reason he gets elected to be the president of the Harvard Law Review is that he's the one uh, person who seems to be able to get along with the conservatives as well as the liberals. And that book that I mentioned uh, on the New Deal, uh, or the, 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 the chapter that deals with the New Deal, draws very heavily on the book written by his colleague Cass Sunstein called The Second Bill of Rights. And his account of the Constitution draws heavily on a book that Sunstein wrote called The Partial Constitution. So he's really, I think, trying very hard to pick the books that are the most widely used in dealing with the issues he's writing about, think critically about them, and then try to take what he finds in those books and set them in relation to contemporary problems. So what I see at work there is a very sophisticated historical sensibility, and which is the reason I was struck by how unusual this is among American historians, because I don't, I mean among American politicians, because I don't see him spinning as much as I see him thinking, and thinking with the materials that we present to our students. So I wouldn't say that he's the greatest uh, writer of American history because this is a book that doesn't have footnotes. It's a book that uh, is a fairly casual uh, read, but I don't think there are inaccuracies in it. Um, if, if there are, I would have to be shown what they are. I think the uh, consensus on every one of those issues that I mentioned today and that I go into in uh, somewhat greater detail in the book doesn't deviate dramatically from the way the contemporary professoriate in American history sees the American past. It's, I mean, I, I would actually, I would tend to agree about Obama being the best, it's certainly according, according to current historiography, he'd be the best. I mean, one of the things I didn't say about Kennedy Profiles and Courage is it actually was kind of up-to-date historiography for the time he was writing. It's just, we just, there's a lot of aspects of that that we just don't agree with. Uh, those of you familiar with the term, the Dunning School, that said Reconstruction was a tragedy and uh, the impeachment of in, and the abolitionists were dangerous radicals. Uh, that's all stuff that was, it was starting to, just starting to go away, you know, go away in the time of Kennedy's presidency, just starting. But when he was in school, and according to the people he consulted who wrote memos, you know, that was kind of latest thinking. Uh, I mean, it wasn't, it was certainly accurate and they actually, it was researched well. Uh, and I'll actually give him the credit. It wasn't obvious stuff. I mean, you know, we're, who came up with Lucius Q.C. Lamar, right? I mean, it's, I mean, there's a lot of those. It's, it's not like uh, Custer, you know. I, I, I mean, it's, not, it's not like big name. It's, there's some big names in American history, but a lot of them aren't such big names. So, you know, give him props for that. Uh, in a future edition of this program, I could see another book being focused on, the title of which is Living History. And it's a book that Hillary Clinton wrote in 2003. And one of the interesting features of it is she begins by describing growing up in a home uh, where her father was a staunch supporter of Goldwater, and that influenced her to be a strong Goldwater right for, for years growing up until she got to Wellesley, I guess. Um, and then a, a much more quiet liberal mother. Um, what's interesting, of course, is that in, is similarly to, to Barack Obama, this would seem to place um, Hillary Clinton in a position to understand how to work with people on the other side of the aisle and to be bipartisan and so forth. And yet here we are, you know, with <laughs> debate showing that we are as conflicted and split as any point in probably in past history. 
So I, I'm asking Rick in particular, since he's written about Goldwater, what he might say about this transition of Hillary from Goldwater right to uh, mainstream liberal. Um, well, in my first book on Goldwater, which I've uh, had uh, occasion to do a little rereading in, because I'm going to be teaching students in Oklahoma a little bit of conservative history next week, um, Goldwater appealed to young people for the same reason a lot of new left, early new left ideology appealed to young people in that in a very bureaucratic society that had kind of been accursed by uh, anonymity and bigness, he was speaking to a certain kind of uh, dynamism, a certain kind of existentialist attitude. Even his, uh, um, even his uh, hardline attitude uh, on the Cold War, basically, you should be willing to die for your freedom, which you know in policy terms meant we should Exercise brinksmanship in the uh, Soviet against the Soviet Union, even at the risk of nuclear war, had a certain kind of um, uh, moral cognate with put your bodies on the wheels of the machine, uh, be willing to accept blows in the spirit of loving kindness. As strange as it seems, so it wouldn't have been strange for a young person to be attracted to Barry Goldwater. In fact, when Conscience of a Conservative came out, it sold very well in college bookstores, which was quite a surprise at the time because the people behind it were all these old people who owned factories and foundries and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I think her uh, evolution was uh, fairly typical of her generation. The, 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 the Vietnam War was um, you know, an ordeal uh, for people who are that age. She, I'm sure, knew people who were drafted and uh, going to college in that intellectual atmosphere. It's uh, not particularly surprising that she should um, make the move left. I guess you could put it. Uh, not necessarily cynical, but you could sort of put a coloration on it that that was, she had political ambitions and that's where the action was, certainly. Um, I, I think I, I would, um, I would uh, disagree with your um, characterization of Barack Obama as someone who, uh, I think he had as much skills as one could possibly muster to, to, to reach accommodation with the other side. In fact, I was gonna ask uh, Professor Klappenberg, my, we had a talk on the Cooper Union Address, which I love, and uh, the professor talked about how well he debunked the arguments that the Founding Fathers uh, uh, wanted to preserve slavery as a prerogative for the states. Another part of the Cooper Union Address is, um, it doesn't matter how good our arguments are, there are reactionaries in the South, and he just really just eviscerates every last argument for slavery that they make. It doesn't matter how good our arguments are, they will not accept them, and all they will accept is our abject surrender before slavery. And the thing I found always so striking about Barack Obama is he's someone who's um, associated himself with Lincoln, he's seen to be a student of Lincoln, and yet this central text of Lincoln that uh, there's a certain kind of reaction that does not admit to uh, intellectual or moral persuasion. I contrast that to his constant injunction, well, I'm gonna keep on reaching out my hand of fellowship to Republicans because the fever will break. The fever will break. The fever will break. Obviously, the fever never break. So I've always wondered about his, himself, him as a student of Lincoln. I think Lincoln was someone who, who um, plunged boldly into uh, the cauldron of conflict and, and war, and someone, uh, and Obama is someone who shrunk from that kind of uh, headlong conflict with Republicans. And he, Lincoln's also was also a, a tough, you know, a, a tough ass party politician. You know, he was a tough Whig, uh, and and a Repub and a Republican in the sense that I mean, I've never, I mean, I, they're both from Illinois. I think you know, and I see every everyone who wants to be like Lincoln, I, I never quite got the Obama's, I never, uh, other than the obvious, the, the idea that they're, they're similar, tall. they're similar in some way, uh, I've never Don't. made much sense to me. And I guess that the point that I would make about, I think uh, centrism and reaching across the aisle, it's a very po great, it's a very positive image, right? It, it really works to elevate, I mean, that's one of the things that I was meant to say, it's very good for elevating the, in, a, in a politics where the candidate's being elevated above above party and above ideology that makes them look good and you can get elected that way. It just becomes, sometimes becomes really, really difficult to actually do anything based on that because. Politics bec is a team sport. Because it's a team sport and, and you've, and you spend so much time actually uh, kind of de ignore, either ignoring party, ignoring ideology or kind of sapping it or kind of uh, basically 
uh, delegitimizing it uh, in a certain way so that we have to go back and act and be tough, to be Lincoln-esque in, in that sense, then it doesn't, uh, doesn't you know, it's, it's hard to pull off. I would just say all you have to do is look at the uh, makeup of the Congress after 2010 yes. and compare it to the makeup of Congress that FDR had and the Congress that LBJ had, and you have a made-to-order explanation no, of the reasons no, why. Because... Yes, you do. The, no. F, LBJ had a two-to-one majority in the Democratic in the Congress when the civil rights legislation came through. Obama had a razor-thin majority for the first two years when he got through the health care initiative and the stimulus package and Dodd-Frank got underway. I think we'll look back 100 years and see the accomplishment of that first term as something quite remarkable given the composition of Congress. If he had had a Congress like FDR's or a Congress like LBJ's, I think he would have accomplished many of the goals that he went into the White House to accomplish. But that's one person's view. Um. Uh, just briefly, once, once he started uh, trying to accomplish things through executive orders and kind of be, became a lot more apologetic about the agenda that he sketched out in, uh, in Audacity of Hope, and it worked, and he became more popular, uh, his uh, counselor, it wasn't David Pluff, it was the other guy, gave an exit interview in New York Magazine and said, we were, sh we were really, really scared about doing all this stuff, but every time we've done it, it's worked out for us. There's still a limit to how much. Oh, of course there is. Sure. Oh, and, I think he's accomplished oh. just about everything you could accomplish with executive order. The more lasting and significant things that he wanted to do about inequality, for example, you can't do without legislative he, approval. He's accomplished a tremendous amount. Just the, I, this, the thing this week where, uh, and it's a great retirement project for uh, Obama and Eric Holder to start yes. worrying about let's state, legis state legislatures and, and, and district districting, but. They didn't pay as much attention to that in 2010 as they could have. And the thing that is that, that if you, FDR or Lincoln, they were paying attention to those kind of, you know, in a, in a more party concept. Pay attention to them. What would they have uh, done? They could have worked to put uh, initiative on, initiatives on the ballot that would have increased off your uh, participation. In the face of the funding that was going into that gerrymandering? No, no, no. I'm not saying that. Uh, no, that it was, well, that, what I have he, a what feeling we're not going to get this. This is a recreation of the debate where, Jim, you were in the same position as I was last night debating oh. about what Obama You're should right. have I done. I wasn't at or, that table. Or, so. And so maybe <laughs> um, <laughs> can we... Office of uh, Information and Regulatory Affairs headed by Cass Sunstein, the biggest bottleneck to regulation right, that right, America right. has seen since Reagan. Right. But anyway, we're having no. fun. Can, can, um, do we have time for one more question? Absolutely. Okay. So we'll, I'm not we'll, we're not, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, okay, my question. Obama is. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh, my question is regarding President Barack Obama. I think the third speaker stated that uh, uh, he said that the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, is a continuing conversation and uh, could change. Does that imply that uh, even at that time, Barack Obama thought that uh, certain elements of the U.S. Constitution actually were in conflict with certain? Uh, beliefs he had at that time, or the Constitution may not be granting certain powers to the executive branch of the government that uh, Barack Obama would like to have in order for him to accomplish his uh, agenda or objectives. Thanks. I think the, the comments that my fellow panelists have made about the use he did and did not make of executive orders might suggest that he was aware of both the possibility of pushing the boundaries and aware that the boundaries remain. So I think the, the, what I was trying to get at, and I think he was trying to get at in the Audacity of Hope, is that the notion that there is an original meaning of the Constitution is incoherent. The Constitution emerges from a series of compromises among people who had fundamental disagreements with each other, and there was no way those disagreements were going to be resolved. So to think of the Constitution as something that is set in stone or has a particular meaning doesn't make sense if you have a historical sensibility that leads you to understand how it came into being and how it's changed over time. But more particularly about the question you ask, I don't know enough about how he was thinking in, the, in terms of executive uh, power to be able to answer it, sorry. If, 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 if Barack Obama as president didn't want to expand the powers of the presidency, he would have been the first president in history to, to do so. I don't have any. <laughs> That's it. Selah. <laughs>
Tom, do you I have guess we're finished, you. yes. Uh, well, tremendous panel. Let's have a round of applause, please. Thank you. And I think we're adjourned. Uh, let me thank everybody on behalf of uh, the CPH and the George W. Bush Presidential oh, Library and Museum. Before. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you especially to all the participants for a terrific day from start to finish. <laughs>